Well, of course, we continue our consideration of Romans this evening, and in particular this last section, which you'll see I've highlighted there, and which we've entitled, The Righteousness of God in Practice. And the reason we called it that, of course, is because this is the practical section of the epistle, which runs from chapter 12 through to some halfway through chapter 15. And the reason it's the righteousness of God in practice is because, of course, the first 11 chapters were all about the righteousness of God in doctrine. And this last section, therefore, is the practical application of the doctrine of the atonement as it's been expounded in the first 11 chapters. As far as the structure of this last section is concerned, you'll be reasonably familiar with this now, it breaks simply into three subsections. Chapter 12, our social responsibilities. That is, both in the ecclesia and in daily life. Chapter 13, our civil responsibilities. That is, those responsibilities in daily life. Expanding, as you'll appreciate, the last half of chapter 12. And then chapter 14, our ecclesial responsibilities. Obviously, in ecclesial life, uh, dealing or expanding the first half of Romans chapter 12. In fact, as I say, this section that we are dealing with this evening runs from chapter 14, verse 1, all the way through to chapter 15 and verse 13, but we're only going to look at chapter 14. I made the comment a few weeks ago when we looked at chapter 9 that, chapter 9, that Romans chapter 9 was my favourite chapter in all the book of Romans. And of course that's still true, even as I've studied up to chapter 14. However, as far as uh, the need to understand chapters is concerned, I'd suggest that of all of these chapters, Romans 14 is the most critical chapter to understand. It's not the most difficult by any stretch. It's not as difficult as some of the earlier sections on the atonement. But as far as ecclesial life is concerned, it's a vital chapter to understand and understand well. And I think by the end of the class tonight, God willing, you'll see why I say that. Now, as far as the Ecclesia was concerned back in the first century, there's something to appreciate. It was a very cosmopolitan Ecclesia made up, we think, of about 50% Jews and 50% Gentiles. In chapter 13, in our last class, various issues were brought up in that chapter in relation to daily life. And those issues particularly affected the Jewish portion of the Ecclesia. I mean, there was exhortation there for everyone, but it was the Jews that were most keenly affected by those issues. In relation to submission, for example, to governments, they had an enormous problem submitting to foreign powers. In taxation, they had a problem rendering unto Caesar what was Caesar's. In loving their neighbour, they had a great problem defining who their neighbour was. So you can see the issues of chapter 13 whilst they affected the entire ecclesia, affected the Jewish portion more keenly than perhaps the Gentile portion. When you come to chapter 14, everything is reversed. This is a chapter which deals with issues of conscience, where there was a group in the ecclesia in Rome who had sensitivities about what sort of foods they might eat, about whether or not they should drink wine, about whether one day was more significant or more special than other days in the calendar. Now these are obviously Jewish predispositions. The law of Moses categorised foods as clean or unclean. The law of Moses made one day more special than another. So you've got a, a, a half the ecclesia having come in from the background of Judaism which has been entrenched in their culture for 1,500 years, they come to the truth, the veil is rent, the law is done away, not so simple to forget all the tenets of your upbringing and the culture that that upbringing has given you. You come into the ecclesia and the law is done away and only the principles of the law are observed. It could be irksome, however, if people started to do things which, in your opinion, held the law in contempt. So there were sensitivities of conscience in the Ecclesia, and I'm speaking here particularly about the Jewish portion of the Ecclesia. Now, I mentioned that Romans 13 was directed mainly at the Jews, and Romans 14 is directed mainly at the Gentiles, yet it's the Jewish conscience that's most active in Romans 14. How can it be directed at the Gentiles then, this chapter? Well, the answer, of course, is that naturally enough, there came a clash in the Ecclesia between 
what was necessary to observe in Christ and what wasn't. The Gentiles, of course, did not agree with the Jews. And they were inclined to insist on their rights. And that caused a problem in the ecclesia. Therefore, not only, but substantially, this chapter is directed to the Gentiles. So chapter 13, he's got the Jewish portion predominantly in mind. Chapter 14, it's the Gentiles he predominantly speaks to. Now that might all sound simple enough, but there's a context even behind this. So we've talked about, if you like, the the demographics of the ecclesia. Now let's think a little bit about the times in which this ecclesia lived. The last verses of chapter 13 told you something about the urgency that was facing these brothers and sisters. In chapter 13 and verse 11 we read that knowing the time that it's now high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let's cast off the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. Things weren't altogether going well in the ecclesia, you see. Ecclesial life was becoming a little bit frayed at the edges. Brothers and sisters were no longer as careful with each other as they might have been when the ecclesia was a lot younger. The standards of conduct were slipping. Apathy was creeping in. People were beginning to indulge in practices which would have, should have no place in ecclesial life. I mean, look at the last half of verse 13 of chapter 13. Why does the apostle have to say, cast off these works of darkness? It should have been done years and years ago at baptism. But, but things had started to creep back in, you see. And as Jesus was to say, or by this time had said in Matthew 24 and verse 12, when iniquity abounds, the love of many shall wax cold. When iniquity abounds, ecclesial relationships break down. Conflicts arise. And the apostle has to tell the ecclesia here in Rome, chapter 14, verse 19, Let us therefore follow after the things that make for peace and things wherewith we may edify one another, he says. It wasn't a sure thing that this would happen. Verse 20, for meat, destroy not the work of God. There was conflict in the ecclesia, you see. There were people standing on their rights and pushing others toward a fear of compromise, which inevitably would lead to the ecclesia polarising and enormous conflict between most probably Jews and Gentiles. Now that, of course, could rupture the entire ecclesia. That's why we've got this chapter. And it's no surprise, you know, that running throughout these chapters, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, is a singular theme which is the antidote to the entire problem. You come back to just a page to chapter 12, verse 9. You read it for the first time here. It's one verse in each chapter. And in chapter 12, verse 9, he says, Let love, the word agapators, let love be without dissimulation. The word dissimulation is the Greek word anhypocritus. Without hypocrisy, unfeigned, sincere. Let your love be sincere. So love, he says, if it really is love, is completely sincere. That's where the word love occurs in chapter 12. Come across to chapter 13 and verse 10. It occurs in verses 8, 9 and 10, of course, but verse 10 will do. Love worketh no ill to his neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. He's writing that to Jews, particularly because it was the Jews that if they ever could have in their 1,500-year legacy, they would have fulfilled the law. Well, he says that's how you do it, by exercising love. So love... If it really is love, it would have our neighbour's best interest at heart. Proven by verse 9. You won't commit adultery. You won't kill him. You won't steal from him. You won't bear false. You won't do any of those things if you really love your neighbour as yourself. So love is sincere in, verse, in chapter 12 and verse 9. It's genuine in chapter 13 and verse 10. And so then you come to chapter 14 and verse 15 and you read it again. If thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not in love. Clearly, if you know your conduct 
is going to antagonise someone and you do it anyway, you don't love them. You just don't love them. And three times, you see, in three chapters, the apostle has to come back to the same point. Love is the missing ingredient. It's been usurped by individual liberty. And the reasons there were problems in Rome was not particularly because the Jewish portion of the ecclesia had scruples that the Gentiles didn't, but because the law of liberty had trumped the law of love. Personal freedom had overcome ecclesial responsibility. And as you'll appreciate, this is a problem not unique to the Romans. I'm going to go down a limb here. I think the principles that the Apostle discusses in this chapter would underline fully half of all the problems in the ecclesial world. Half of all the problems in the ecclesial world could be solved if we applied correctly the principles of Romans chapter 14. That's why I say this chapter is so important and we must understand it. Well, the structure of the chapter is very simple. I'm just going to speak here of chapter 14, as you'll see on the slide. Verses 1 to 13, I've called division in the ecclesia. Verses 14 to 23, unity in the ecclesia. So the chapter essentially splits into two halves. When Paul talks about division in the ecclesia in the first 13 verses, he speaks of the need for mutual respect and tolerance of individual consciences on non-fundamental matters. And that's a critical point to observe. There is conflict in the ecclesia of Rome. It's not about doctrine. There's nothing in the statement of faith in relation to Romans 14 as far as this conflict was concerned. It was about individual consciences, perceptions on the rightness or wrongness of certain non-fundamental activities. And in those 13 verses, verses 1 to 13, he's speaking to both groups, to Jews and Gentiles equally. Verses 14 to 23, he talks about unity in the ecclesia, the need to exercise love, as you've read in verse 15, in their liberty of conscience, in order that the ecclesia might meet together in peace. He's speaking here to the Gentiles, particularly the Gentiles, as the group who was morally indifferent on many of these non-fundamental issues. And he's speaking to them in this last half of the chapter because, as we'll see, the solution lay with them. They were the group that could solve the problem in a way the Jews just could not. Hence, the last half of the chapter to the Gentiles. Well, when you come to chapter 14, he doesn't really talk about Jews or Gentiles. I mean, you won't read the word Jew or Gentile in this chapter. You don't really find out that he's got those in mind until halfway through chapter 15. Instead, he uses two other different words to describe these groups of people. Chapter 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. Chapter 15, verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. He's going to talk about the weak and the strong. And if you're taking notes, it was the Jews that were the weak. It was the Gentiles that were the strong. Now we've got to explain what that means, but they were the two groups. uh, There there might have been some Jews who were strong and some Gentiles who were weak. But most Jews would have been weak and most Gentiles would have been strong on the issues we're going to raise. Now, when I talk about weak and strong brethren, or when we talk about weak and strong brethren today, we mean something very different to what Paul does in Romans. I mean, if if, if you heard that somebody was a weak brother today, you might think that they were a bit apathetic, perhaps a bit superficial, perhaps a bit worldly. Or if you heard they were strong, you might think, wow, that's somebody who must be a keen Bible student, who's a, a good attender, very diligent in the ecclesia, and committed to the truth. That's not how Paul uses these terms. That's not what he means by these terms. In this ecclesia, we would reasonably presume both Jews and Gentiles were strong in the truth, good attenders, extremely committed to what they believed. When we talk about weak and strong, therefore, in Romans chapter 14, we're talking about weak and strong in relation to the conscience. 
Weak and strong in relation to the conscience. What's Paul speaking about are brethren with weak and strong consciences on one issue or other. A weak brother, biblically defined here, is a brother who has a sensitive conscience on an issue and makes rules for himself to live by according to his conscience. In Romans 14, this, as I say, was the Jews. They wouldn't eat certain meats. They wouldn't drink wine. They wanted to keep one day more special than another, particularly the Sabbath. You see, and they had a conscience about those things. They were not morally indifferent on those things at all. A strong brother would be one who has no attachment to a particular issue. He doesn't see it as an issue at all. He could partake or he could refrain. He would be indifferent on it. Was merely, it would be merely an issue of preference on the day, whether he did this or that activity or not. And in Romans 14, on the issues I've mentioned, food, wine, days, that would be the Gentiles. They just didn't see the issues that the Jews saw. So let's think about this in terms of Scripture as a whole. Think about the law of Christ and all the things that we might do in life as far as the Bible is concerned. Well, for simplicity, and this is a bit of a simplification, I'm going to consign every activity you could do into one of three areas. Things which are forbidden by Scripture, like robbing banks. Things which are required by Scripture, like baptism. And then, by far the largest group of all, things upon which Scripture is entirely silent. Now, if if things that are forbidden are the black and things that are required are the white, then, of course, this middle section is called the grey area. And that's why we call it the grey area. Not everything in the grey area might be an issue of conscience. I mean, there might be morally indifferent things like driving your car down the street. But many things in the grey area will be issues of conscience. A strong conscience would allow you to do those things. A weak conscience would not allow you to do those things. You see? It's a bit of a simplification, but you see the general point. In that grey area, of course, we have to make decisions on how we will conduct ourselves based upon biblical principles. And our conscience is going to guide us on what we should do. The issues in this grey area, for the purpose of our discussion here, are not wrong in themselves. I mean, if it's a sin to do something in the grey area, then it's in the black area. It's, it's forbidden by scripture. We're talking about things that are not wrong in their cell, themselves, in which brothers and sisters have latitude on and will disagree on. It is critical for me to agree with you on whether the Trinity is true or not. And if we don't agree, we're going to break fellowship. Non-fundamental issues, however, it is not critical for us to agree on. We don't have to agree on them. And we might come to a different landing on these things, particularly in our personal lives. The only issue that's ever going to arise between us is when we come together in the ecclesia. We're going to have to work something out then. But these are non-fundamental issues that we're speaking about here. So one brother might make a decision one way, another brother might make the opposite decision. And you see, it's the way we look at the issue that makes the difference. Our understanding of our Bibles, the background we've come from, our foresight perhaps, all of these things will play upon the kind of decision we make according to that, how we apply that issue in our lives. It becomes a matter of principle for us then, based upon an association of ideas. But here's the important point. Once you've come to a landing on an issue, whatever that might be, and you genuinely believe it to be wrong to do, then if you do do it, it's a sin for you. And what I'm saying here is, We've got a particular issue. I'll give you an example in a moment. But we've got an issue, and it's not wrong of itself. You could choose to do it, or you could choose to not do it. God doesn't care in terms of the issue of itself in an outright sense. If, however, you come to a landing on that and you say, well, I don't think that God would be especially happy if I do that thing here or there or in this way, and you become convinced by that, and you've got a good logical reason for believing that, and you do it anyway, it's a sin. 
Look at verse 14. That is, it's a sin for you. I know, he says, and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. Not to you, maybe not to me, but to him. Because he's developed a conscience on that issue. What if he goes and does it? Verse 23. And he that doubteth is condemned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. He's violated his own conscience. And therefore he's sinned. Even though the issue of itself is not a sin. It's not forbidden in scripture. James 4 verse 17. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him that is sin. It's your enlightenment that makes the difference, you see. Because it's your enlightenment that that creates your conscience. And at all cost, as far as God's concerned, whenever you violate your conscience, you sin. If somebody doesn't have the same conscience as you and they do the very same thing, they may not sin, but you do. Not, not hard to understand, but that's the point of Scripture. So let's be clear on two things. Two brethren might look at the same issue and come to two entirely different conclusions. Both of them are perfectly sincere. And secondly, we are talking here about non-fundamentals. We're not talking about doctrinal issues. If, If the Bible speaks explicitly on an issue, then it's a matter of doctrine. It's not a matter of conscience. Thou shalt not kill is not a matter of conscience. I mean, I understand... If, if you killed somebody, you might have a conscience about that. But the point is that it's not a conscience issue. It's a prohibition. It's a doctrinal issue, you see. All right, so how do you know if you've got a conscience on something or not? Well, look at verse 15 of Romans chapter 14. If thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not in love. Now, this word grieved is an interesting word. It's the Greek word lupio, and it simply means to make one easy or to cause him a scruple. That's how Thayer's lexicon defines it. You're grieved. It doesn't just mean you're upset. I mean, you are upset, but you're uneasy, and you're, ca- you're caused to have a scruple. Now, what is a scruple? We talk, about, we talk about people who are scrupulous or people who are unscrupulous. What's a scruple? A scruple is a feeling of doubt or hesitation with respect to the morality or propriety of an action. Something deep down inside you says, that's just not right. It's the little voice that says, it's not right. And you are now scrupulous. You've just developed a weak conscience on that one issue. Now be careful how quickly you categorise yourself as a weak or a strong person in relation to the conscience. You might be weak in one area where I'm strong and I might be strong and you're weak because we're at liberty to come to different decisions on non-fundamentals. But if you have a hesitation with respect to the morality of something, it's now an issue of right and wrong for you. That's your conscience talking And you cannot and you must not violate it, you see. This is what creates conscience issues in us. We're not talking about matters of preference anymore because you're going to hesitate in relation to the morality of the thing. So whether the walls are blue or white, that's a preference issue. You're not going to consider that an issue of morality or propriety What kind of issues are we talking about then that could be conscience issues? Well, dress stands at ecclesial meetings would be one. We're coming before God on a Sunday morning. We're likely to feel, at least most of us, very strongly about that. But equally, it's not a fundamental issue. There's no uniform requirement in the Bible. And so long as we tick all the obvious boxes, such as modesty, we can wear what we like to the meeting. All right, so would you come to the meeting in a Nazi uniform? There's nothing unclean of itself. It's just a piece of material. Could you break bread in a Nazi war uniform? 
Well, yes, you could. Is it an outright sin? No, it's not. Would you do it? Would you do it next Sunday? If not, why not? If you had a feeling about the morality of that or the propriety of that before God, you've got a weak conscience on a certain dress standard at ecclesial meetings. You see the point? Dresses or trousers on girls would be an example. Social drinking would be an example. Whether or not we should celebrate Christmas would be an example. Whether we should use leaven or unleavened bread at the memorial meeting would be an example. These are all issues upon which there is no explicit commandment one way or the other in Scripture, but which we must use biblical decisions to make, biblical principles to make decisions on, and which for many of us may become more than simply a matter of preference. I think you see the point. All right, so let's have an example. Social drinking. There's quite a wide range of areas where you could choose or not choose to drink wine socially. Do we or don't we socially drink? Should we or shouldn't we socially drink? So let's make the case. The strong brother will say this. Yes, we can socially drink. There's no problem with it. Jesus drank wine at the wedding in Cana. In fact, the first miracle he ever did was turning water into wine for social reasons. There was no need to have wine at that wedding. Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach's sake. The only prohibition, the strong would say, that scripture has against wine is in drinking to excess. It's fine to drink socially. Not that we have to drink, the strong would say. Whether I do or whether I don't is nothing to me. But I can if I wish to. There's the case. And he's going to have biblical quotes behind it. Well, the week says, sure, brother, but I've got a different point of view. The first mention of wine in Scripture saw Noah drunk. The first time wine appears in Scripture, and it's drunk to excess. The Rechabites are held up in Scripture as a family of faith because they didn't drink wine. The Nazarite wasn't even allowed to touch the grapes that wine came from. And the Proverbs, read them, they're eloquent on the dangers of wine. Proverbs 31 verse 4, it's not for kings, O Lemuel, it's not for kings to touch or to drink wine, he says. And he feels that morally he can't drink socially because it violates scriptural principles. And so you see, two brethren, both with Bibles behind them, both sincere, can come to a different landing on this, what we're calling a non-fundamental issue. If we're talking about drinking to excess, it's fundamental, it's a doctrinal issue. We're not talking about drinking to excess. But one is strong and one is weak on this issue in relation to their conscience. And there's no point, there is no point trying to negotiate a compromise between them because for one of them, drinking is not an issue. He can or he, he, he will or he won't. It's a, simply a matter of preference. But for the other one, it's a matter of conscience. He can't because of the morality, his perceived morality of the thing. If they both lived on desert islands, the issue would end there. The problem is they both live in the ecclesia in Rome. Or they both live in the ecclesia in Tea Tree Gully. And so they've got to address the problem. And if you look at verse 21 of Romans 14, wine... And the drinking thereof was precisely one of the issues that they debated 2,000 years ago. And it's remained, let me tell you, a hot topic amongst religious circles ever since. Think about the temperance unions in the, uh, unions in the United States. It's a hot topic today amongst conservative Christian churches the world over. Social drinking, I mean. You look up the Southern Baptist in Texas, an extremely hot topic. Very strong debate on this issue, on many other issues, in the same way we have them in Christadelphia. This example, however, of drinking wine also illustrates that whether you have a conscience on something or not, it's not necessarily binary. For example, look, we could have a complete abstinence of all wine, including at the meeting, and serve grape juice at the meeting. Some churches, some Christian churches do that. We could then say, no, no, that's too extreme. We're going to drink, but only at the meeting. 
No, no, too extreme. We're going to drink at the meeting and at home, but not outside of our four walls. Or perhaps we are going to drink socially in public. Or we could go one step further and we could say, in fact, we're going to drink ecclesially. Now, the weak conscience who said, I don't agree with drinking wine socially, probably wouldn't advocate complete abstinence even at the memorial meeting. And the strong conscience who did believe they could drink wine socially, even in public, probably wouldn't advocate us serving wine on a Sunday afternoon at a fraternal meal. So you see, we now have graduations of conscience on the same thing. And sincere brethren will come to different landings on this. Well, with that as an introduction, now let's talk about Romans 14, because we're in a pretty good position to understand it. Verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations, he says. So here are our two groups, weak and strong. And Paul begins the chapter by speaking to the strong. Him that is weak, receive ye. Because as we're going to see, the solution to the problem here lies with the strong. And he talks about the weak as being weak in the faith. Now, the definite article is not there. He's not weak in the faith. He's weak in faith. That is, weak in one point of faith. As I mentioned a moment ago, the brother that's weak on wine might be strong on a dress standard in terms of their conscience and vice versa, you see. Well, what's his weakness? What's the weakness of the weak brother in verse 1? Verse 2. For one believeth that he may eat all things, and another who is weak eateth herbs or vegetables. And you have to appreciate that the word faith in verse 1 is the same as the word believeth in verse 2. So he that's weak in his belief believes that he can only eat vegetables. He can't eat meat. He's got a sensitive conscience on one point of belief. He understands that all foods technically are allowable. They're not a sin of themselves, but they're not all allowable to him because he's formed a view that all foods aren't equally acceptable to God. Now we've got a clue, of course, as to the nature of the issue, as we've already read in verse 14. There are foods that are clean and there are foods that are unclean. Well, that was the Jewish issue. The issue of verse 2, therefore, is most probably relating to Jewish food laws. But does that mean uh, a brother's weak in the truth? Not at all. He's got a weak conscience on this one issue. The fact is, however, that God did make no distinction between one food and another. Jesus said in Mark 7 and verse 19, what comes out of the heart of man, that's what defiles the man. And he said that, the record says, purging all meats. So there was no problem with any kind of food. You could eat grasshoppers. You you could eat worms. You could eat whatever you liked. God didn't care. But this brother cares. It's an issue for him. And when you're confronted with an issue like this in ecclesial life, what do you do? Well, he starts the, verse in, the chapter in verse 1 and he says, Him that is weak in faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. The margin says, not to judge his doubtful thoughts. The New American Standard Bible, not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. All of us have sensitivities in one area or in another. Therefore, it's not for us to go and try and argue away the conscience of another brother or sister. He's formed it. Let me read verse 14 again. To him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. He believes it to be unclean whether you agree or not. And when it says he esteems it to be unclean, the word esteem here in verse 14 is the Greek word logosomai, from which we get the English logical. The word literally means to compute or to calculate. The point is, he's made a reasoned decision. He hasn't made an arbitrary decision. It's not just a matter of preference. He's made a logical decision. You come back one page, I'll show you why he's made this logical decision. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your logical service. It's the same word. He's looking for the way he can logically serve God, you see. And he's decided logically in his mind that not all meats are equal. Not all foods, at least, are equal. So this is a brother's studied attempt to give God his service of reason. Under no circumstances, therefore, can we seek to undermine that because that's exactly what God wants him to do. You see? Now, it's interesting, you know, because you might, just in listening to me speak on this, you might have made the immediate connection with Paul's other words to Corinth. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Because when we talk about issues of conscience, (coughs) you might remember, Paul writes very similar ideas to the ecclesia at Corinth. Interesting, by the way, that he wrote the letter to the Romans from Corinth when he was actually living in Corinth. It was delivered by Phoebe from St. Crea, you might recall. We have the issue of conscience that appears here in 1 Corinthians 8. Look at verse 1. As touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies, he says. So we all have knowledge concerning idols. But, verse 7, not everyone has the same knowledge. There is not in every man that knowledge, because some, the weak, with conscience of the idol unto this hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled, he said. So in Corinth, there were two views about meat offered to idols. Some brethren said you could eat it, it's just a piece of stone, it's like eating meat offered to a statue. The idol is not a god. And others, who perhaps had come from that background, said, whoa, not so fast. I can't do that. In all good conscience before Yahweh, the God of Israel, I cannot do that. And you've got a difference, you see. Now, who was right? Well, in principle, the strong was right. The idol's nothing. But because of an association made with that idol, perhaps from their previous history, there was a certain group of brethren that could not eat meat offered to idols in Corinthians, or in Corinth. What's the answer to the problem? Verse 13 of chapter 8. Wherefore, Paul says, If meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest my brother, uh, lest I make my brother offend. I will not be the cause of a bad example. I will not cause somebody to copy me and violate their own conscience. And when you come to chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians... You've got a practical demonstration of this principle in action. Look at this in chapter 10, verse 25. Whatsoever sold in the shambles, now the word shambles means marketplace, and the reason it's called a shambles is because it was a shambles. There was (laughs) tables and livestock everywhere in the Corinthian market. Whatsoever sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Don't ask the butcher if it's been offered to an idol or not. Forget it. The idol's a statue. It's nothing. Because all the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. So the boss takes you out for lunch with your business And they, I don't know, they serve beef. Uh, Don't ask whether it's been offered to idols, just accept it. Uh, But if any man say unto you, uh, oh, by the way, brother, this is offered in sacrifice to idols. Oh, that changes everything. What, has the meat changed? No, the meat hasn't changed. It's still smoking away there. But your approach to it now has instantly changed. Eat not for the sake of him that showed it. And for conscience sake, because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So it's God's meat, you can eat it. It's God's meat, you can't eat it. You see? Conscience, I say, verse 29, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? He says, look, this begs the question. Uh, Yesterday I could eat, today I can't eat. Why is my freedom to eat or not limited by someone else's conscience? I don't have a conscience on this issue. 
If an idol's nothing, then meat offered to idols is offered to statues. There's none other God but one. What's the problem? It's okay to eat the meat. And this is a fundamental point of ecclesial life, isn't it? And here's the answer. Whether it's right to do an activity or not is not based on whether you or I have a clear conscience on the thing, but on whether it gives God glory. Now, of course, if you have a conscience against it yourself, you can't do it. But if you've got a clear conscience and another brother doesn't, you can't eat for the sake of his conscience if you're together. Why? Verse 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, because God owns all the meat. God owns every issue. So it might be fine to eat. It might not be fine to eat whenever and wherever you like. And for that reason, the apostle makes the simple point in verse 23 of this chapter. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. It's illegal to use our liberty in Christ as a license to the flesh. So come back to Romans. Understanding that from Corinthians, you'll appreciate the arguments very similar in Romans, but there's a difference. And this is the critical difference between Corinthians and Romans. What's the problem in Corinth? Well, the problem was idols meet. But you don't read anything at all about idols meet in Romans. Romans is talking about Jewish food laws. What was the risk in Corinth? Well, the risk was that a strong brother could lead a weak brother astray by his inconsiderate example. That's not the risk in Romans. Romans has got much bigger problems than that. Look at verse 3. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Can you see the problem? In Romans, the weak aren't in the least bit intimidated by the strong. They are not likely to copy what they believe to be the bad example of the strong. Instead, there's conflict, there's immediate conflict between the weak and the strong on this issue of eating meats in Romans chapter 14 and verse 3. And look at the language. (laughs) The, The strong despises the weak and the weak judges the strong. This word despise, it's a very powerful word. It means to treat with utter contempt. The strong hates the weak. Like he hates them. In verse 10 it says, Why dost thou judge thy brother from the point of view of the weak? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother from the point of view of the strong? So the word despise in verse 3 is the same word as the word set it not in verse 10. It means to treat with contempt. So the strong brother immediately becomes ungodly. He sneers at the weak because he can't believe that anybody could be so ignorant as far as the Bible's concerned. As far as he's concerned, the weak is so far beneath his dignity that he's not worth speaking to. This word despise is the same word you find used in Luke 18 and verse 9 in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. About certain that trusted that they were righteous and despised others. So this despising that the strong has of the weak is the very same despising, the very same hatred that the Pharisee had of the publican. The Judaizers in Corinth did exactly the same to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 10.10. They said, said that his bodily presence was contemptible and they really hated the Apostle Paul. And they spat at his shadow, didn't they? So why did the, why did the strong despise the weak so strongly? Because the weak was limiting their freedom. And they think they're being blackmailed into Judaism. But the weak's by no means beyond reproach. In fact, he may bear even more reproach because he judges the strong. He doesn't eat, but he judges the strong. Now, the word judge means to condemn. And as you read how that word's used in this chapter, it's pretty clear that the judgment of the weak is eternal. 
by which I mean he believes that the understanding of the strong is so abysmal that he's really not worth being called a brother. He's really not worth being called a brother. He's unfit for the kingdom of God because he's such a liberal and he feels, the weak feels, that the strong is trying to blackmail him into humanism. And you can see this is, you can see an extremely different cast of problem to what you just read in Corinthians. Corinthians was very one-sided. The strong had the knowledge and the bad example, and the weak was, was likely to trip up and stumble and perhaps leave the truth, serving idols. In Rome, nothing of the sort. The strong and the weak meet each other like this. And the ecclesia is polarizing along racial and cultural lines about to blow apart. And you've got one brother that spits across the room at the other. And the second brother he says, I hope you're not in the kingdom with me. Like extremely violent reactions to each other. On non-fundamental issues. We're not talking about Christadelphians and Catholics. We're talking about Christadelphian and Christadelphian. But that's the strength of language the apostle uses. That's what was happening in Corinth. In the words of Psalm 50, verse 20, he speakest against thy brother and slandereth thine own mother's son. It was a shocking situation. Well, you might say, is Brother Clark overstating the point? Look at verse 4. Who art thou, speaking to the weak, who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. As I say, the verse written to the weak, because the weak was the one that did the judging. The problem is that the weak has usurped the position of God, and the strong, it so happens, is God's servant. And the word servant here, the usual word for servant in Scripture, is the Greek word doulos, which means slave, bond slave. This is a different word. This is the Greek word oikites, and it means a household servant. This servant was treated like a member of the family. He's like a butler. And if there's one thing you can absolutely rely on this master to do in verse 4, and that is to exercise tolerance toward his servant. And not only will the master defend him, he'll make him stand. He will acquit him. So Christ will acquit the strong of his misdeeds, such as they might be. The weak has gone too far. The weak has consigned him out of the kingdom of God. And you can see the seriousness of the problem. So say, nothing like this in Corinth. We've got an ecclesia in Rome about to blow apart. What's the solution? Well, the apostle commences in verse 5 and he says, Now let's just put down some principles. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. The strong sees no difference between one day and another. The weak thinks that some days are more special. The notable example would be the Sabbath. Uh, When uh, the Apostle Paul finished his third missionary journey in Acts 21 and verse 20, he went to the Arrangian Brethren of Jerusalem where he concluded the journey just before the Feast of Pentecost. And they said to him, Paul, thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe and are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Is it true, Paul? And you can see the issue affected him personally when he went to Jerusalem. The very same issue. But the fact is, in verse 5, whatever your decision is, you might esteem one day above another, you might esteem all days the same, God accepts you because it is not a fundamental point. But I'll show you where this can go wrong. You come with me to Colossians 2. We're talking in Romans about non-fundamentals upon which brethren are at liberty to disagree and may fall on opposite sides of the fence. If we're on desert islands, that makes no difference. If we're in the same ecclesia together, that may make a difference. Here's where it can go terribly wrong. Colossians 2 verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. 
Now, how do you reconcile that in verse 16 with what we've just read in Romans 14? There appears to be a contradiction, you see. In Romans, Paul is extremely gentle with the weak. And he counsels the strong not to antagonize the weak. In Colossians, he's very aggressive against apparently the same issues. Well, what's the answer to the riddle? Well, the clue is in the phrase at the top of verse 16, let no man. Look at verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in worshipping angels and voluntary humility and so forth. What's happening in Colossians? We've got Judaizers coming in teaching that if you don't follow their lead on non-fundamental issues, it's an issue of salvation. This is exactly what the Pharisees did in Matthew 15 and verse 9. They made the observance of the law a doctrinal matter. Now what's happening in Romans is you've got Jews wanting to keep certain points of the law of Moses. They've got a conscience about that. They're not trying to make that an ecclesial issue, but they just can't come at people profaning the Sabbath, for example, like, I don't know, having a working bee on Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon. They can't come at that in their ecclesia. What's happening here, if I was to make the same parallel in Colossians, the Judaizers would be saying, if you hold a working bee on Saturday afternoon, it's a salvation issue. You're out of the kingdom of God. Because they've taken... Well, Matthew 15, verse 9, the Pharisees made for doctrines the commandments of men. Romans 14, we're talking about non-fundamental issues, food laws, certain days. The issue in Colossians 2 is that the Judaizers came along and made those into doctrinal issues and added to the statement of faith. You see the difference? Paul is extremely tough on that teaching in Colossians 2 beguile you with enticing words, spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. He uses none of that kind of language in Romans 14. Romans 14 is genuine consciences, weak on this or that point, not trying to make those issues matters of doctrine. Okay, back to Romans. What would that mean as far as our example was concerned previously about socially drinking wine? Well, the genuine weak brother would say that he couldn't socially drink for conscience reasons and that he wouldn't want to be involved with people who did. The Judaizers would say, anyone who drinks socially won't be in the kingdom of God because, you see, he turns a conscience issue into a doctrinal issue and makes for doctrines the commandments of men. That's the difference. Romans, you've got genuine brethren with sensitive consciences, nothing whatsoever like what you see in Colossians 2. Romans 14, verse 6. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, and he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. I always used to wonder, by the way, how you can eat not and give God thanks. I think what it must mean is that he abstains from some foods and gives thanks for the foods that he does eat. But you can figure that out for yourself. The point is in verse 6 that each side has made a decision. The issues are non-fundamental. God will accept them whatever their decision is, to abstain or to partake. Did you notice the phrase that's reiterated all through those verses? Unto the Lord, unto the Lord, to the Lord, to the Lord. Six times, four times in verse 6 and twice in verse 8, the phrase unto the Lord occurs. And that's significant because this is a phrase of religious devotion. It's a phrase of religious devotion, which tells you straight away these are not trivial matters or simply matters of preference. Ephesians 5 verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. It's not a matter of preference whether a wife submits to her husband. If she's, got a, if she's conscientious in the truth, it becomes a matter of principle. 
Ephesians 6 verse 5. Servants be obedient to your masters as unto Christ. You see, it's a matter of principle. This is a practical application of, giving, of, of doing all to the glory of God. There's a deliberate conscience decision being made here in verse 6 for the sake of the truth. The problem is that the weak and the strong can't agree on how to do that. Verse 7. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. That's a... Perhaps a little bit ambiguous, but it's not difficult. He's not speaking here of literal life and death. If you live to something, you do it. The strong. If you die to something, you abstain from it. The weak. And so you just come back with me a couple of pages. I'll show you an example. Romans 6 and verse 10. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Living and dying in a figurative sense. Romans 6 verse 10, for in that he died, he died unto sin. Now he physically died, but died metaphorically unto sin. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So Christ literally died and rose and metaphorically died to sin and lived to God, as it were. That's how the word's being used here in verses 7, 8 and 9. But of course, there's a critical qualification made in verse 7. None of us liveth to himself, and none of us dieth to himself. You can use your liberty in Christ in a correct or in an incorrect manner. And here's how the apostle speaks on the issue to the Galatians. Galatians 5 verse 13. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. You can, you can see the resonate, it resonating with what we already know from Romans. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. If this gets away in your ecclesia, just make sure you don't turn into cannibals, he says. Because, of course, it certainly can, can't it? Well, because whether we live or die to an issue, we do it to the Lord, he says this in verse 10. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it naught, thy brother? We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He comes back, therefore, to the point that he made earlier in verse 4 about standing before Christ. And we're all there because the Lord wants every one of us. And why are, they, why are we there? Well, they're there, we're there to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The word stand means to present ourselves. It's exactly the same word as you read in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Present yourselves a living sacrifice or present your bodies a living sacrifice. And that'll be the question we answer in verse 10. How much does our sacrifice mimic that of the Lord's? How much we really like him? What was our reasonable service? Verse 11. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. What shall every tongue confess? The answer is, Philippians 2 verse 11, Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's what every tongue shall confess. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. The word account here is the Greek word logos. It means a verbal account. So what would the Lord say? Please explain to me, brother, in very clear and simple language why you despised my servant. Please explain to me, sister, in very clear and simple language why you judged my servant. And both of you tell me why you did that on behalf of me. How would you like to give that verbal account? Verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, spoken to the weak, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way, spoken to the strong. 
And that concludes the first half of the chapter, the first section of the chapter where he addresses both weak and strong and lays out before them the issues that were facing them and the principles underpinning those things. From verse 14 to the end, he now speaks directly to the strong. Because, of course, the power to solve this problem lies with the strong. And look at the logic. Verse 14. We've read it now about three times. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. The apostle does not enter into the debate on the issue of foods. He simply says, I agree with the logic of the strong. There is nothing unclean of itself. But if somebody has a conscience against an activity, it's unclean to them. And therefore, he says, don't antagonize the weak. Verse 15. If thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not in love. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Don't insist on your rights when you know it's a sensitive issue. Uh, Otherwise, you're in blatant disagreement, as you can see on the screen, with Galatians 5 and verse 13, the top verse there. And there's only one reason you'd ever grieve somebody, and that's pride, isn't it? There's only one reason. Love doth not behave herself unseemly. Love suffers long. Love does not vaunt itself. Lest you destroy your brother for meat. The word destroy means to bring to ruin, as the RSV says. Or bring disaster upon as the New English Bible says. Now, how do you do that? How can you destroy your brother? In one of two ways. By inflaming his anger, in verse 4, so that he judges you, which he ought never to do, or by emboldening his conscience against what he thinks is right, so that he copies you, and therefore sins, as verse 23 says. For whom Christ died, verse 15. Destroy not the weak, for whom Christ died. Which, of course, raises the entire argument to a different plane, doesn't it? The strong is being asked to make a small sacrifice. If he refuses, he might invalidate Christ's major sacrifice because the salvation of the weak is in the balance and it would be his fault. It would be his fault. Verse 16. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. Your good is the knowledge of the strong. But in fact, everything he stands for is called in question if he pushes his rights, isn't it? His exposition, his character, his whole life and the truth is called into question. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in, as it ought to be, a spirit of holiness. So the strong has created a problem. He's right in principle, but he's forced the issue and now he's made the kingdom of God a matter of meat and drink. No one cares about righteousness and peace anymore. That's long gone. It's all about meat and drink. But in doing that, he imperils his own salvation. Not because he's wrong in his exposition, but because he's wrong in his conduct. This is how Brother Carter says it in Romans, in his book on Romans. The weak made the eating of some foods a matter of reproach. The reproach could be avoided if, uh, sorry, by not partaking of such foods, and this is advised. To make the point clear, Paul repeats that all things indeed are clean. The wrong he is considering is not in the meat, but in the eating. And in the use of freedom, the strong might be guilty of this wrong. A thing right in itself may be wrong through its effects. The way of self-denial is the noble way. And think about that, the way of self-denial. Isn't that the very spirit of the atonement I mean how was atonement made for us it was made for us by a man sacrificing his will to the will of God that his righteousness might be imputed toward us would you want to copy him or would you not well since you're not going to sacrifice yourself physically in what way do you die for your brethren That is the practical application of the atonement in this section of Romans, isn't it? Isn't it clear? Verse 18. 
For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of man. Look at that. If the strong doesn't insist on his rights, he gets the respect of both God and man. So the exhortation is in verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things that make for peace and things wherewith we may edify, sorry, one may edify another. Follow after the things. The word means to pursue, which implies you've got to chase it down. It's not a sure thing. It's not easy to catch. Peace in the ecclesia doesn't happen by magic. It requires diligence. Peace in a marriage, I suppose, doesn't happen by magic. It requires diligence in any relationship we have. It's not automatic. Verse 20. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offence, he says. You can see the contrast with verse 19, between verses 19 and 20. Verse 19 says, uh, destroy. Whoops. Destroy, what does he say? Destroy, verse 20, sorry, says, destroy not the work of God. The end of verse 19 says, edify one another. The word edify means build up. The word destroy means pull down. So don't demolish the work of God, verse 20, but build it up, verse 19. It is good, verse 21, neither to eat flesh or drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. And you'll see it's good in verse 20, as a, sorry, verse 21, as opposed to evil in verse 20. So a contrast, verse 19, 20. A contrast, verse 20, 21. But of course the protest comes from the strong. He says, hang on, whoa, too much, Paul, he says, too much. This is unreasonable. I've got right on my side. There is nothing unclean of itself. You just said so in verse 14. Does my exposition count for nothing, says the strong? Verse 22. Hast thou faith, says Paul? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. New International Version. Blessed is that man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Now we've already considered one way in which the strong might condemn himself. And that is in verse 17, by making the kingdom of God an issue of meat and drink. But you know, there is one other way that the strong can condemn himself. You come with me to 1 Corinthians 10. I'm almost done. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 19. A little knowledge, you know, can be a dangerous thing. And the strong has got a little knowledge. But he might not have a lot of knowledge. His conscience is clear as far as he's concerned. He's he's pretty solid on his exposition. But look what the apostle says here. Verse 19, 1 Corinthians 10. What say I then? That the idol is anything? Or that which is offered and sacrificed to idols is anything? But I say, no. That the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils, he says. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. What does he mean? Well, the strong has become so strong that he goes up to the idol's temple. And he's in fellowship with devils. He's in fellowship with false gods. But the strong protest, he says, there's no such thing as an idol. It's just a statue. Chapter 8, verse 4, there's none other God but one. But the apostle says here, yes, yes, verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 10, I understand there's none other God but one. I understand that idols aren't true. You're in fellowship with idols. How can you be in fellowship with idols if idols aren't true? Do you see what's happened? The strong has become so strong that at some point he's crossed the line and he is out of fellowship with God even though his conscience is clear, even though he's participated in something which is not fundamental. For crying out loud, idols don't exist. But he's out of fellowship with God. And look what Paul says in verse 22. You strong, he says, Do you provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You've made yourself even strong with God and you're out of fellowship with God for partaking of something which was, might I say, 
not wrong in itself. But the association of it was so strong that you're out of fellowship with God. But that would be the second way that the strong could remove himself from the kingdom of God. So come back to Romans and let's finish. We're almost at the end anyway. Chapter 15, verse 1. This is Paul's conclusion of the matter. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbour for his good to edification, for even Christ pleased not himself. How would we summarise that, brothers, sisters, young people? This is, I think, what we've found. Paul writes Romans 14 chiefly to the strong because the solution lies with them. The strong believe they have liberties in Christ, but the weak have a conscience against taking these liberties. This conscience is strong and is based upon a logical argument. Pressing the issue causes problems in the ecclesia. Both parties sin, the weak judge the strong, and the strong despise the weak. Since the issue is not fundamental, that is, it's not a sin of itself, Paul, in principle, agrees with the reasoning of the strong. If the strong gives way, however, he makes a small sacrifice. If the weak gives way, he voids his conscience. Since, therefore, the kingdom of God is more than meat and drink, and since the strong can freely partake or not, I mean, he's indifferent on the issue, the strong must give way. To do otherwise would not be to show love, in which case the strong would sin. Instead, he should use his knowledge to edify even Christ pleased not himself. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to answer for our conduct in these very matters.